uh, today's notices for the maternity of the Mother of God and the 19th after Pentecost. Uh, we thank you for all you who have subscribed to our YouTube channel because uh, that helps us to do the live streaming now that we're doing every day. So you'll note in the bulletin uh, the live streaming each and every day. Um, next Friday, we have the Right to Life film Unplanned after the 5.45 p.m. Mass. Uh, and uh, Unplanned is the film bringing an eye-opening look inside the abortion industry from one woman's inspiring true story of transformation. Uh, also present will be Anuska, the Education Director and right of the Right to Life Association of WA and also the Director, who will lead a discussion about the film and Right to Life issues in general. So all welcome to attend. Uh, also advertising on this, uh, a Marian Mantle Consecration 46 day spiritual retreat for heaven's help. Uh, more about that uh, during uh, in the weeks ahead. That begins on Wednesday the 28th of October through to the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the 12th of December. And uh, please take note of the other notices. Uh, Adult Legion of Mary meeting on Friday uh, at 11.30 and this week the Children's Legion of Mary at 2.15pm on Thursday after the 1.15pm sung mass. So um, please take home a copy of the notice. Uh, the epistle today is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brethren, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, who according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak ye the truth, every man with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your anger. Give not place to the devil. Let he that stole, let him steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have something to give him that suffereth need. And a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St Matthew. At that time Jesus spoke to the chief priests and Pharisees in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who made a marriage for his son. And he sent his servants to call them that were invited to the marriage, and they would not come. And again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them that were invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my bees and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come ye to the marriage. But they neglected and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the rest laid hands on his servants, and having treated them contemptuously, put them to death. And when the king heard of it, he was angry, and sending his armies, he destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he saith to his servants, The marriage indeed is ready, but they were invited were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, call to the marriage. And his servants going forth into the ways, gathered together all that they found, both bad and good, and the marriage was filled with guests. And the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he saith to him, Friend, how thou camest in hither, not having on a wedding garment? But he was silent. And the king said to the waiters, Bind his hands and feet, cast him into the exterior darkness, where there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There are two similar parables in which people are invited to a great feast but turn down the invitation. Today's is found in St Matthew's Gospel. The other is from St Luke's Gospel which is read on the second Sunday after Pentecost. From the chronology of the Gospels it appears that our Lord related these parables at two separate times. They seem not just to be two different recollections of St Matthew and St Luke but actually uh, two different parables said at different times. So this suggests that there was some urgency on our Lord's part that people understand the concept of accepting the invitation to the kingdom of heaven. In the parable related by St. Luke, the invited guests simply make excuses. I must go and see my property. I must try out my new yoke of oxen. 
I have just married, so I cannot attend. But today's gospel, the behaviour of those invited, is far more reprehensible. They treated his servants shamefully and killed them. Now both parables, of course, allude to the kingdom of God set up on earth so that God can redeem his people from the original sin of Adam as well as from their own personal sins. There is both a public and a personal dimension. We can think of the wedding feast as representing God's church on earth. And at the same time, we can think of it as a banquet in which the most blessed sacrament is the main course, surrounded by all the other sacraments and sacramentals that God gives so freely to us. Now, in the public dimension, the invitation is an ancient one. Immediately after the fall of Adam, God promised to send a woman whose seed would crush the head of the serpent and return mankind to grace. This invitation was extended thereafter to many others, to Noah, Abraham and Moses, amongst many others. The psalmist even speaks of glorifying God among the nations foreign to Israel. Psalm uh, 17. And God himself is recorded by Isaiah as saying, I will gather nations of every language, they shall come and see my glory. Isaiah 66. Now as we know, in the fullness of time, he sent his son as a personal messenger to extend the invitation in a more direct and personal way, much to our good fortune. He told a Roman centurion in St. Matthew chapter 8 that many will come from east and west and will feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So the invitation then to join the public kingdom of God is widespread indeed, stretching out even to the ends of the earth. But sadly enough, just like in the parables we have heard, there are many who refuse the invitation. Some of them have excuses. I just don't have the time. I am more preoccupied with the things of this world and have no interest in the things of heaven. I have just married, so I cannot come, and so on. But others are far worse. As the invitees in today's gospel, they treated God's servants shamefully and killed them. As we know, they killed the Son of God, all but one of his twelve apostles an uncountable number of martyrs that continues on to this very day. A certain nun in Somalia comes to mind, a priest in Iraq that I know of that was killed for the faith, and many Christians in the Holy Lands who have existed there since the time of the apostles being murdered by Islamic extremists and others. And our Lord told the centurion then that why many would come from the nations of the east and west the kingdom of the children of the kingdom would be put out into the darkness outside where there would be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. St. Matthew chapter 8. Now, this is the same phrase that our Lord employed in speaking of the man without the wedding gum. Put him in the darkness outside where there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this same phrase he uses when speaking to the centurion and today in the parable, speaking of the man without the wedding garment. Now, who is this man without the wedding garment? Why was he expected to have one, seeing how he was brought in just from the street? Now, in the ancient world, the outer garment for a formal dinner in a wealthy house in Israel was supplied by the host. During the heat of day, people walked about in a linen garment, much like the alb that priests wear for mass a long sack-like affair, gathered in at the waist with a rope. When they relaxed at table in the cool of the evening, the host would furnish them with an outer cloak from his ample wardrobe. It would keep them warm, and the tailing of the garment would add festivity to the party. If a guest joined the dinner party or the wedding feast without a festive garment, it was through his own fault. He had simply not bothered to stop in the cloakroom, per se, to dress correctly for the occasion. So this seems to agree with what our Lord is saying in the parable about the man who had on no wedding gum. He had simply not bothered to put it on. So the man without the wedding garment 
is the one who has learned about God and his son, but ultimately has rejected them. He prefers to cling to his old ways of evil, continuing mistaken beliefs and bad behaviour. He was offered the garment of faith, the wedding garment, but had no inclination to put it on. The man without a wedding garment, then, is the one who received the faith in baptism, but allowed that faith to die for a lack of charity, the love of God and love of neighbour, for the love of God. As St Paul said, Even if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have charity, I am nothing. So the man in the parable was offered the garment of charity, but he refused to put it on. And the man without a wedding garment is the one who received the faith, loved God for a while, then gave up hope, turning away from God's ways to the ways of the world and the ways of sin and eternal death, never even thinking to ask God for forgiveness in his heart. And the man without the wedding garment then is any of these and all of these. We can only commend them to our prayers and good example. Just let us be sure that we never find ourselves in their place as the man without the wedding garment. We would all know plenty of people, alas, that perhaps are in this category. Let us then be sure then that we preserve the holy Catholic faith that we have received from those who have gone before us, ultimately from our Lord Jesus Christ and the twelve apostles, keeping that faith untarnished and unscratched as though it was a precious jewel wrapped in silk. And let us be sure that we preserve hope, the knowledge that we will one day be with God in heaven if we but cooperate with his graces, nourishing that hope by remaining habitually in the state of grace, doing nothing that would place us in the darkness outside. And let us be sure then to preserve charity, the love of God, by joining our love to his love, very frequently in our prayers and meditation, by doing good for our neighbour for love of them. And finally, let us preserve all these things, faith, hope and charity, by taking part frequently in the wedding feast of the King's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The invitation is not just for one day or one night. Rather, we are invited every day to sit down at the sacrificial banquet of the Lord, each day that we are in the state of grace. Let us be sure that we make no frivolous excuse, lest we find that through our coldness and carelessness, we find ourselves amongst those cast in the darkness outside, where those who refuse the Lord's invitation find themselves weeping and gnashing their teeth in all eternity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.